Hi, uh, welcome to uh, the ODI's uh, Friday lunchtime lecture. Thank you very much for joining us, whether or not you're in the room or uh, watching on our stream at home or wherever you may be. Uh, my name is Miranda Marcus. I'm the Research and Development Program Manager here at the Open Data Institute. And I'm pleased to introduce uh, two fantastic speakers today. We have Marius Jennings and Steve uh, Crawshaw from Bristol City Council. Um, they will be talking today about uh, the city's innovative approach to open data with a focus on air quality data. Uh, so Marius is going to be describing um, the collaboration with city partners and the role of open data in delivering the commitments on, uh, on the mayor's, mayor's one city uh, plan as well as Bristol's new smart city strategy. Steve is the council's air quality officer uh, and has worked for Bristol for uh, 21 years and is currently supporting in the development of the uh, council's clean air plan. Marius uh, is in the council is the council's open data lead. Uh, his work yeah, has focused on the delivery of various smart city initiatives across the subregion. So we are in good hands to learn about all of the interesting and exciting work they've been doing. Um, I'd ask uh, if you could save questions until the end. We'll be doing Q and A. Um, if you could speak into the microphone uh, when you have questions, so that the people watching on the f uh, stream can also hear. And also, uh, we'll be taking questions from Twitter. So if you have a question and you're watching on the street, uh, then just tag it with the hashtag ODI Fridays. Uh, thanks very much. Over to you guys. Well, um, a big, big thank you to everybody uh, coming today and for everybody online who's come to speak to us. Um, so again, my name is Marius Jennings and I work with Bristol City Council uh, around our open data. And so We've got quite a packed agenda today, uh, which we're looking to go through with uh, yourselves. So we're going to kind of plow on for about half of the presentation will be myself and then my colleague Steve will be speaking as well. So to just give a bit of a historic overview, uh, Bristol has been involved in open data for a number of years. We've been experimenting and seeing how do we get to grips and start to understand about the power of, of data. And so that's had different iterations. Originally, we were doing a little bit of work through an, an internal program that we had that was looking at uh, GIS and how we could provide a bit of open data that way. And then we moved on to uh, a program called Socrata. And then we've recently had uh, further procurement and we've been in the safe hands of Open Data Soft for uh, the last two and a bit years. So the reason that we look at open data is we see it as a really powerful uh, mechanism for a city. Uh, ultimately, we are accountable uh, to our residents and we are here to show them what we're doing with their money. And this is a way that we can do this. So uh, a lot of our work is to see how do we experiment and use data to look at a demographic uh, dialogue between our citizens and ourselves. How do we increase a transparency? And how do we become more accountable for what we're doing? And so in a, a very slim way, that could simply be things like uh, providing information to freedom of information requests. But really what we're trying to do is provide more curated data journeys for our citizens and interested parties so that they can understand what that data is around and what data is useful for them to be able to inform their decisions as well as them providing the data so that it can make some sort of meaningful impact for the city as a whole. Um, one of the things is Bristol has a great uh, local digital economy. Between Bristol and Bath we have a turnover of around 10 billion pound uh, dollars per year and Bristol is ranked as one of the top 10 EU cities for technology so this is an area that is really important for the council and we would want to be supporting that but also emerging talent in the creative and digital sector uh, sector So at the moment, where we are is we have a platform that can be found at opendata.org. Uh, 
www.gov.uk and that is where we put around 180 data sets across around 14 different themes that might be transport, it might be parks, it could be things like quality of life and that's ever evolving and changing as we go forward and I'll discuss a little bit later about our next phase and that iteration to provide even more data and better quality data going forward. Um, things that we've been trying to do and that we've discovered through our journey is trying to simplify the look and the feel and a better user experience for your everyday citizens so that they're able to access data quite easily and understand it and having that curated understanding on things like air quality that Steve's going to be talking about and being able for people to understand uh, different parts of the city uh, and to be able to compare the different factors uh, around education and a whole range of other th um, things. So to give you a little bit of an understanding uh, of how we've been going around open data, we've also been doing a big uh, engagement program and we call it our Data Bristol. And this is really to say that um, this data isn't the council's, it's everybody's. And we want to have an approach where we are working internally with our stakeholders, but externally as well, um, to see that people find what we're using as a benefit. And so what we have done is uh, create the brand of our, our data, but then also link it in to what is known as the one city approach, which is Bristol's um, aspiration to change the city by 2050 around different thematics. So it's putting that information in there as well. And then also looking at what are our corporate uh, themes and uh, strategies. So really making open data practical and showing the benefit of it um, around the city's wide strategic focus. Um, So what we do is have a range of events that we do every four months, an iteration, and that will start off by having a stakeholder event where we will engage uh, somebody around a theme. So that might be around maybe well connected and around transport. So it's getting uh, local charities, people from internally in the council, as well as other interested members of the public and so forth to come together, show them what data we've got and then find out what data they are interested in and what, what can we go and find. So it's about that collaborative approach of seeing what do we do, what more do we need to do and get their input and what would they want to be seen with that data. And then from coming out of that we use that as a, that research to go and squirrel away, find the information that we can, try and update our data sets, provide additional information and then we'll move on to uh, a hackathon, uh, which we'll normally have over two days or a weekend. Uh, we really try to aim that more at our universities and our emerging tech and uh, creative sector. So we'll do a lot of work that kind of helps build their portfolios and the like and gets them engaged and seeing really novel new ideas around how you can use open data. And then coming out of those hackathons, we will also then go and do um, mini project commissions where we will offer seed uh, funding of one and a half thousand pounds to three different teams where they'll be given around eight to ten weeks to further develop their ideas and then come back and present how that's been a benefit to the city. And so as the, the diagram shows, that's run an iteration that just pretty much summarizes our approach our facilitation approach. Uh, and this gives an example of what we recently <coughs> done. Uh, we have Errol in the audience, which I'm really grateful to, um, who came along to one of our events, and Marvin Reese is our mayor. And what we were doing as one of the things that we've uh, asked for the uh, 2019 as a focus around period poverty and making Bristol a city where anybody who needs a uh, period product is able to access it and that's our aspiration for this year and so what we've done is we've taken open data we've held a hackathon we've put a bit of funding behind it and we're in the process of developing an app and so getting UX uh, experience getting developer experience getting data science people volunteering in to create this uh, digital solution our aspiration is by 
the end of the year we'll have something that's uh, completed and then we'll be showcasing it in January for the benefit of people in the city. So that's a really practical uh, idea and showing how we're actually doing open data right now. Um, this just shows our events and things that we're doing and it really is getting together a range of probably 30 to 60 people per event, uh, getting them to understand what the issues are and what they're interested in and then working together and it's very collaborative. The idea is that we don't necessarily know all the answers, we kind of want to know what your feedback is and your input around it. Are we going around the right track or are there things that we haven't considered? That's the brilliance about this. We have some of the data, but it's getting that novel uh, hive mind to be starting interpreting and being creative and, and using these great skills that are out there. So uh, one of the things that we did was we created a brand called uh, Data Brain, and I created that as a way of really encouraging uh, new entrants into coding and to university students or individuals who are just interested in, in the topic to come along and we'll award them uh, the data brain uh, either a first or second prize and those prizes will comprise um, things like uh, the opportunity to go and meet with some experts build their networks there'll be some sort of activity that they can do in a morning or afternoon so it's all about developing that individual's portfolio further and helping develop that talent that is just brilliant in Bristol. We are very fortunate in that we've got four universities nearby and two that are in with Bristol itself. So we really want to be using this data for good uh, and for academia and the like as well. And then anybody who comes to our events obviously gets a uh, certificate of participation and the like, but it's really seeing this as a two-way process of trying to make this valuable for those who engage with us. Um, I mentioned a little bit earlier about the mini commissioning. So apart from the Perry uh, Dignity app that we're in the process of developing, this just gives a flavor of the mini commissions that we have uh, commissioned so far. So it's things like Eco Roots, and this is an app that goes and measures someone's route by GPS and says it suggests an alternative route that will minimize their emissions. We've got things like mobilized construction, and that will do an analysis of road quality and health and detect potholes that are then fed back to the council. We've got a great little app called Triffids, encourages people to go and use our green parks and our spaces and you go along and you can find out about a specific tree because in the council all of our trees has an app, have an asset number and then using things like Wikimedia and other assets and the like we're able to then put together this app that tells you more about that tree. We, are, uh, in Bristol, our aspiration is to be carbon neutral by 2030. So uh, one of the projects was looking at the solar panel potential of buildings uh, and what could be implemented to help achieve towards that target. Chatbot is something that we're just about to finish. It's a conversational AI system that we'll, be, uh, we'll use with our open data so that it makes it easier for people to access open data. And EcoBricks is looking at uh, plastic waste and novel idea of actually using what is an EcoBrick uh, for building as a building material. Um, but one of the things I just really want to mention, the reason that we're successful in what we're doing is that we work together with lots and lots of partners and there are lots of people who are kind of unsung heroes who give up their time or work internally and externally to enable us to do things and that makes it brilliant that we've we're able to do so obviously places like the ODI node in Bristol the ODI in London having Organizations like the Women's Tech Hub in Bristol, um, I want to particularly mention uh, organizations that I've subcontracted to help us with our work. Um, uh, one is This Equals, so I do a lot of work with uh, John Kellis, who's helped us really facilitate our program of events and engagement and seeing how it can be educational and of benefit. Uh, we've got Sophie here today as well, which I'm really grateful to, to really kind of inform those expertise and and wealth of knowledge that we don't necessarily do have internally. Uh, another organization is a data place. 
uh, and Martin Howitt, which, who has provided those uh, technical skills and expertise around open data that's really help us refine our governance and the way that we're using open data in the council. But there are lots of others um, that I too many to mention and I probably haven't put everybody in there. Lots of organisations and universities but a big thank you and also to our internal GIS team and our strategic business intelligence team and our sustainability team. They're all amazing. They just help us do these things because if we didn't I didn't, wouldn't have the data out there and I wouldn't have the understanding of being able to to make this a benefit. So uh, moving on a little bit around our approach to smart cities. So we've recently launched uh, the Connecting Bristol um, uh, strategy, which has come out, and that really looks at how we want to be moving forward uh, across the city uh, to be engaging around uh, all these things that I've been talking to you about, um, uh, Bristol's got a, a strong history of being a green city and its asp aspirations around uh, carbon neutrality, trying to address our digital divide. We're a city that's really of two sides. You've got some elements such as the very wealthy parts of Bristol and then the other sides, you've got uh, really uh, high levels of deprivation and you've got uh, education divide as well. So how do we start looking at some of those issues and seeing how we start putting people at the forefront of this and instead of working from a top-down approach then also working from a button-up as well and seeing what are the, the challenges that our city face and then from the challenges then we go forward and start saying okay this is our response or how do we do uh, innovation, how do we look at ethics and putting trust into place, how do we look at uh, innovation management and so forth. Um, so under this umbrella of uh, the Connecting City, we have the Connected City Service. So part of my team is City Innovation. And so we're a small team, but we're a great team of really dynamic individuals who are really, really enthusiastic on various different fields. And they will work with different partners to see how we can tackle urban issues and how we can implement uh, smart city solutions but very much around, let's be practical, what is in the area of possibility, uh, though we want to be facing in the future, what can we do now, and how do we work with these amazing partners around us regionally, but also nationally and internationally as well. Uh, we are very fortunate to also have a, an organisation called Bristol is Open. So they are, were formed by the University of Bristol and Bristol City Council. They're now owned by uh, Bristol City Council and they're our own pilot testbed that enables us to have our own internal network where you can try out different ideas and the like. So we're then able to take some of the ideas that we have in Connecting Bristol, transfer that into the Bristol is Open. And we also have a very uh, state-of-the-art uh, operations centre which is a, a little bit more operationally focused which is operating 24-7. It had a 8-point million uh, a million uh, investment back in 2017 and that delivers a lot of things around public safety, um, core handling for quite vulnerable people within our city, um, helping with things like security or loan working and um, monitoring our roads and if there's an emergency civil protection and so forth. And these are a great bunch of people who are doing this 24-7. So our aspiration is then taking more of that data and seeing how we can make that open but really be more intelligent about this massive data that we get from our transport networks and the like and making that available to those people who are interested but also internally trying to break down silos within uh, the system within Bristol City Council so that there's more of a strategic benefit around this. Um, just before moving on, we've uh, also got Bristol City Council's um, ICT uh, who are great and we've got aspirations on how do we provide more of this data going forward and I'll be talking uh, just at the end that we have a, an aspiration of creating a, a data lake and we're going to be doing a lot more work so that where there is data internally on the council we'll be really be considering is that data automatically should that be made open data so we've just got so much more that we'll be able to share and make available uh, of benefit. 
and then also our service teams in Bristol City Council, like I mentioned beforehand, working with more of them to look at how open data can be used to solve some of the challenges that they've got. Um, I'm going to move on to Steve now. Um, he will be talking more about the uh, air quality side. Thanks, Marius. Hi, yes. Uh, so with this, we're going to take a bit of a deeper dive into uh, air quality as a specific issue and the specific um, set of open data that we put onto our platform. Um, so I just want to set a bit of context about that. And air quality, as you may or may not know, you probably do, as, as you, quite a lot of you probably live in London. It's quite a hot issue at the moment, and uh, it is the largest environmental risk to public health. And in our own survey, our quality of life survey, it shows that 72% of people are concerned or very concerned about air quality. And at the moment, there's a particularly high profile because uh, there's been legal challenges in the court. The government have lost three times. And so many cities across the UK have been directed by government to bring the concentrations of one particular gas, nitrogen dioxide, into legal compliance as soon as possible. So that's really focused minds, and obviously people want to know, well, what's the data behind this? What, what actually are the concentrations? How bad are they for my health, my family's health? And we see the open data portal as a key mechanism for making that data transparent and accessible to people. So for many years, we have published that data on a, on a fairly old legacy website, um, bit clunky, bit 90s. Uh, and actually, we did uh, in 2012 trial uh, a linked data platform with a local company called Epimorphix, who actually provide the, some of the open data um, for bathing water quality and that kind of thing for the environment agency. But now, as Mario said, we've got the, uh, the new data, open data platform with Open Data Soft. And so it's a natural thing to try and uh, look at the ability of that to host our, our open data. And I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in the next few slides. So uh, uh, we use Open Data Soft's platform. I, I really like it. Um, they're not paying me to say that. Uh, <laughs> but I think it does have a great uh, user-friendly interface, uh, both as a consumer of the data and as somebody who manages the data. There's some JavaScript tools for, for mapping and charts, and they make those available through their widgets, which are fairly easy to use. Uh, there's Ang AngularJS enabled templates, which um, handle some of the logic in the, in, when you're building dashboards and things like that. And I think one of the really key things is there's a very well documented and easy to use API there that, that supports aggregations and real time feeds. And really, without that, we wouldn't be able to have the, the features that we've got on our portal. And um, Philippe is here in the audience and has been always really helpful when I've got um, technical questions because I'm not, a, I'm not a programmer, I'm not a data scientist, but um, I have managed to kind of make all this work to some extent. So um, our main problem then, or our problem in terms of getting that air quality data onto a public facing open data portal is firstly getting it from out in the out on the site and you can see here there's the three different types of data uh, air quality monitoring continuous analyzers uh, diffusion tubes which monitor an annual mean uh, of this gas nitrogen dioxide and then you've got these newer instruments for example the one on the right hand side there which is a lower cost sensor using electrochemical sensors and they're becoming quite prevalent now so we need to kind of get all the data back from these instruments into our office and then back onto the open data portal. So we've got Bristol City Council has about six continuous analyzers around the city and we dial into them using GSM uh, or landline modems that comes back to a corporate database. And then there's DEFRA, the national government have over a hundred uh, monitoring sites around the country and uh, you can download their their data from, from their um, for that that link that you can see there. They do provide an API, but I've not been able to make it work. That's probably just me. Uh, but they do also have some HTML tables of recent data, and that's what I've been using to get, the, to get that data onto our open data portal. Because really, as far as the public are concerned, they don't really want to know the distinction between DEFRA and Bristol City Council. They just want a view of all the air quality data in their local area. So we have provisional data, which comes in live, if you like, on a live stream. And then also we need to ratify that data on a monthly basis um, 
So there's some processes involved in making sure that that data is corrected and calibrated properly. And as I say, we've got all these low-cost instruments that are now coming online, and generally they come with, a, with an API, which we can use to deliver a real-time feed onto the portal. But they're not uh, of a high enough standard that you can check compliance with the air quality limits against them. So you need to caveat some of that data to make sure that people don't see it as absolutely gospel in the same way that the, um, the data from the council or from the, from the national government is. The other type of instrument, we've got a little diffusion tubes. You may see them sometimes if you look up onto lampposts. They're little transparent tubes and they absorb gas at a known rate and they're sent off to a laboratory and so the there's a manual process that sits, sits behind that, but then you can put the data onto the portal and we have that, we have that um, data on our portal as well. So what do we use to kind of pull all these disparate data sources together? Well, there's a product called FME Server. Some of you may know it. It's a company called Safe Software and it essentially automates all of these um, data processes and uh, in, a, in a fairly non-programmatical way, so you can do it just by building uh, kind of nice flow charts. Um, and that posts the JSON feed from the real-time data up onto the uh, ODS portal hourly. So there is real it's real-time data going up there. We then have to do that monthly ratification that I talked about, and then annually we update upload the diffusion tube data. So at the moment we've got about 1.3 million continuous observations, so that's hourly data going right back to 1998, and I think that's probably the most comprehensive open data set um, in the UK that's available in that form from, from a local authority. So all that mass of data we've then used to build um, or to underpin some of the information products that we've developed, and, and I suppose the main one is, is the air quality dashboard. Uh, with quite a lot of support from Open Data Soft, we've managed to um, pull all those sources together and really provide intuitive visualizations, maps, charts, tabulations, and the ability to download the data um, f from the user in a fairly uh, easy way, we hope, um, using, the, using the components there. And I think that's quite a good example of how we've managed to save money by not paying for a bespoke air quality data website, but using the power of the open data portal that we've already got. And we also used it to develop data stories, particularly around some work that we did on schools monitoring, where we, we monitored at about 50 schools in Bristol uh, to provide some reassurance to parents that um, their children weren't being exposed to dangerous levels of air pollution. And then we also put out stickers with QR codes on all of the, um, on all of the diffusion tube and the continuous monitoring sites. So people can just see the QR code, it says air quality under it, they can scan it with their phone and they'll get an instantaneous, uh, a nice tailored web page for that particular monitoring site which shows them the current levels, historical trends, that kind of thing. So it's a, it's a kind of real, well it's internet of things but it's kind of a bit more um, uh, manual than, than that. So uh, this is my last slide. I'm going to hand over to Maris to uh, um, wrap up. But so we're we're looking at um, we, we're reviewing our current platform at the moment, and we're looking at um, potential uh, options for it going forward. And we're also trying to think about whether it's more sensible or or practical to have some kind of regional open data platform, because clearly, well, in Bristol we have uh, four quite small local authorities geographically but they go to form the regional west of England region and clearly there's some strategic data sets like transport and planning and economy uh, that might be better served than having them as a uh, at, served at a, at a regional level. So these are some of the things we're thinking about in the uh, short to medium term. I'm just going to hand over to Maris to wrap up. Thank you. So that's been a really quick um, overview of what we're doing and apologies if I've been trying to just say too much in too little time but what we would encourage you is that we've um, managed to get some funding from Innovate UK who find who are very kindly um, going to be hosting a hackathon with us and Bath Hacked on the 8th to the 10th of November 
and that will be as part of the Bristol Technology Festival at the Engine Shed. So we have a meetup group called Our Data. Um, please have a look. Come along. We, we really love for you to be there. Uh, we also do a lot of work with uh, BBC Academy. So in January, there will be the uh, next round of Digital Cities. And so we're working with uh, the Foundry, which is part funded by the, the, uh, the Coding Institute. And we'll be running a gameathon and a hackathon. And again, we really would encourage people to come along to that and feed in and see what we're doing. So thank you again to everybody who's made the effort to come in today on a Friday, as well as everybody at home. And please contact us. If you are interested, go to the platform. There's a contact form there. Come through to me, and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. So thank you. So uh, thank you to you both. That was absolutely fascinating. And I love the trees and the lampposts and the fact that you can go and find out about those directly in uh, more or less uh, technical ways. Love stickers, yeah. <laughs> um, are there any questions in the room uh, for these two guys on that talk? Great. Are there any indications that the local property industry is getting worried about how this information might affect property prices? Could you elaborate a little bit more? I'm sorry? Could you, could you elaborate a little bit more around that? Yeah, well, people are all the time mm. looking up different things mm. before they buy houses. Mm. It's actually today's conveyancer. Sorry, I was a conveyancer up in Bore for yes. England. But that's got ones today about people don't look at the size of the garden. Don't look at the size of the garden. They look at the speed of the internet yeah. in there. Here you are providing them with a mm. lot of information yeah. which could be used between agents in different sectors. And okay. I wonder if this is a matter yeah. of concern. So I, I guess what I would say is that is the beauty of open data, is that it should be agnostic. You're providing the information, and some of that might be good, and some of it might be bad. And as a council, obviously, we would be some, t some of our data that we're providing about ourselves not, might not be that great, and some of it might not be. But I would rather that we provide that information and put it out there through different means so that more people are informed and can make the decision themselves as long as that information was accurate. But I, I understand what you're saying. I don't have a detailed answer that I can provide you, but from what I can understand, that would be my my. What concern. you have to appreciate is that it's very likely that you will get opposition mm. because the lawyers and the conveyancers in particular mm. hate open data. Okay. They are wedded to the idea of caveat emptor, which okay. is the exact opposite of it. That's really interesting, and I, I just one of the partners that we're actually working with is uh, uh, Legal Hackers, and so what it is, it's a group around the world of individuals who are in the legal industry who are really interested in actually providing open data and data in general for civic good and for third party. So they may well be those people who aren't happy, but I'm meeting a lot in the industry who are. So it, it's uh, uh, of courses for courses, but I understand what you're saying. Thank you. Okay, have we got any other questions in the room? And don't forget that uh, if you have a question and you're watching on the feed, then I'm keeping an eye on uh, the hashtag ODI Fridays, which is written just here as well. Great, thank you. Just a very techie question. So you, you use two different suppliers or portals. Uh, I'm curious to know, without having to mm. you know, stick to the commercials or anything mm. like that, um, what were the common lessons you learned? Uh, was there anything interesting in terms of process um, that the two different suppliers enabled you to uh, to use for the, the publication. So we're talking about Socrata yeah. and um, so I'm going to be really honest, Giuseppe. Um, I wasn't there when uh, Socrata was in place. I, I've been around for the last 14 odd months, and I've been primarily with Open Data Soft. But I think from the requirements that we had it moved better for us uh, and also that Open Data Soft is a European portal um, and has a focus specifically in, the, uh, uh, in Europe and obviously has extended. So I can't really give them much about but all I can say is my experience of that has been, there are obviously any portal, there are good things and strengths and, and sometimes weaknesses, but it, it's been working for us. Any other questions? Yeah. Ooh, here we go. 
Um, you might not have been able to talk about it this time, but do you have projects that look at uh, data liter literacy and digital literacy? Because mm. like these projects are all super, yeah. super awesome, mm. but they're only as good as like techies are already yeah. techie, <laughs> right? Yeah, <laughs> brilliant. Yeah, that's a great question, Errol. Um, so. We do. Uh, I work quite closely with our digital inclusion project manager, and so, in some ways, their project isn't as advanced at the moment. I used to run Bristol City Council's uh, digital inclusion work, and we aimed specifically at getting people to have basic skills so that they can get online. As more and more services, by default and preference, go into digital, and that you have less and less that you can necessarily be able to phone or uh, go there. It's, it's, it's really important and I think what we're doing as part of our Innovate UK hackathon is looking at the digital divide and inclusion and Sophie's doing a lot of work for me at the moment really looking at that particularly when you've got things like uh, pension, um, universal credit where that is requiring more and more people to, to go online and the like so those are things that are really prevalent and we hope to be exploring but it's, it's really important. Thank you. I heard a rumour that it might be uh, Digital Inclusion Week this week, so... I think it is, so yeah, call out to Digital Inclusion Week, thank you, yeah. Oh, amazing. Uh, awesome. Any other questions in, in the room? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, and uh, thanks for the presentation. I'm quite new to the data world, having just yeah. joined an AI startup across Brilliant. the road in the last few weeks. Um, so I'm interested in what your biggest challenges are for, mm. for you to achieve your objective. And you're yeah. based in Bristol. I'm working with a company that's looking at data in the UK and across yeah. the world. So yeah. how, how can we help oh. with that as well? I think what's amazing, uh, something like AI, where you have some really amazing creative ways that you're doing, doing working, I think what we as councils can do is we can try and develop and get data, but uh, maybe one of the things is starting to get access from other methods. So one of my aspirations is going into next year, making more of that data from other partners, whether that be NHS or the like, so that we've got that there. But if there are organizations that feel uh, passionate and are prepared to share data that is open, fantastic. And it's also really that digital cluster, those skills that we can provide you with data, but then it's how you utilize it. And there may be things that we haven't even considered about, mm. or we don't have the resources our, ourselves, but the civic good then comes out of that reuse of that data with combining it in different ways that we haven't really thought of beforehand. Yeah. Okay, Thank you. Okay, thank you. And, okay, quick question uh, from me, actually. Mm. So, um, you're clearly doing a lot of really fascinating work and mm. a huge amount to engage with the community. Mm. Um, when it comes to the detail of data about citizens, the communities mm. that they're living in, uh, and maybe personal data mm. about them, um, are you having a lot of conversations about things like the amount of time that you can hold data about them? Are there mm. are you are those types of things starting to come out in, yeah. in this type of discourse? Because it's it's fantastic mm. that you have this platform and there's yeah. so much interesting stuff that you're talking about. Mm. Um, but as you get engagement in terms of people being open and understanding in the mm. I, in the ways that you can uh, publish data, it also becomes a little more, more mm. complicated for them, doesn't it? Exactly, and I think. It's a getting people to actually understand what is open data. I think for a lot of people, they may have idea, understand the concept. A lot of people don't. I think there's a lot of people who are not necessarily understanding uh, the spectrum of data um, around it. Um, but that's something that we want to explore more. I think particularly with our strategy is looking around things like data trust and how do we as one partner, not the main partner, but one of the partners in the city, uh, work with our citizens and other organizations to see are uh, there, is there a data uh, repository where people feel more comfortable around the holding of their data and how that data is used. Those are things that we're all exploring, but it's kind of like the next iteration, but it's very timely that you're mentioning it because it is part of the, uh, the strategy that we're looking to explore. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and with that, unless there are any other questions around, then I think we will uh, once again say thank you so much to uh, both of you guys. That was absolutely fascinating. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.